Have any of you ever been in a Christmas pageant before, either in school or at church? Raise your hand if you've been in a Christmas pageant. What role did you play, Marsha? Shepherd. Angel. Angel, angelic messenger. Anybody else? Something different? Lay the baby Jesus in the manger. What about here? What role did you play in your Christmas pageant? Yeah. One of the wise men. One of the wise men. So you're a wise guy. Thank you. Yep. Joseph. I was Joseph. Once I carried the donkey. Well, I didn't carry the donkey. I led the donkey across the stage. You know, my, uh, yep. Snowflake. Snowflake. Excellent. My first Christmas pageant, I was four years old. I was a stick boy. Let me explain. Now, if you remember from the best Christmas pageant ever, there are no small parts, only small actors. But I was both a small actor and I had a small part. I think because they wanted to figure out a way, our church at Trinity United Methodist in Spartanburg, South Carolina, wanted to get the little kids involved in the Christmas show. Because let's face it, we love to see the little kids at Christmas time up singing and doing stuff. So I was one of the stick boys, and our job was to carry sticks in behind Mary, put them down for her fire, and then she would tell us, thank you children for your help, but I think I hear your dad's calling. At which point we would leave the stage area and go sit with our parents out in the congregation. So I had a small part with no lines. Now if you know me, that probably you know that doesn't sit well with me. So it's the night of the show, and uh, I've got my little bathrobe and slippers on. i got my sticks in my hand. The congregation's full. Everyone has their tacky Christmas sweaters on, because that's what you wore in 1986. And we were ready. And so I followed Mary with my sticks. And we got out there, and I put those sticks down. And Mary said, thank you, children, for your help. But I think I hear your dad's calling. Now keep in mind, I had a small part with no lines. But I had an announcement to make. I said, you don't hear my dad calling because he's not here. He's at home watching the football game. (laughs) At which point, as you can guess, everyone's laughing. My mother's like, I'm not here. And I'm like, what? You know, I had an announcement. I wanted to share the news that my dad was indeed not there. I didn't want Mary to be proved a liar on Christmas Eve. So, the, now the congregation would have had no idea that my dad was at home watching a football game. Some of them might have noticed he wasn't there, but they would not know why, except that I had revealed to them through an announcement. I was a stick boy, but I kind of wanted to take on the role of angelic messenger. That's one of my favorite stories in the Christmas story, the story of the shepherds and the angels, and the angels' announcement to the shepherds. Whenever I think about it, I think of it's a Charlie Brown Christmas, and there's a little tree, and Linus up there with the blanket on the stage in the spotlight as she tells the story. Today's word is revelation, and we've been going through words in Christian vocabulary. We've talked about faith, and sin, and confession, and grace, and today is revelation. And we hear that word, and sometimes we might jump all the way to that last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, and think Revelation's all about the end of time and apocalypse and things. But Revelation is called that way because the author was revealed by God some things that he wrote down. Revelation is a revealing by God. The angels give a revelation to the shepherds. So hear this story again from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 18 of the revelation of the angels to the shepherds. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. 
So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Let us pray. Come now, Lord, in power and come in might. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My sister couldn't sleep on Christmas Eve after hearing that passage. My mom was like, why? You got to go to sleep because Santa's coming. You got to be asleep. And Laura's like, no, no, I'm too scared. Mom said, well, what are you scared of? The angels. I said, well, why are you scared of the angels? She said, because the shepherds were sore afraid. They, I, I'm sore afraid of the angels. She heard that word in the old King James, sore afraid of the angels. She didn't know the rest of the story. The angels came to bring good news. She just heard the shepherds were afraid. How do we know things anyway? I mean, how, how do we know things? How do we get knowledge? There's a whole branch of philosophy dedicated to figuring that out called epistemology. How are we able to know things? Immanuel Kant, a great 19th century philosopher, suggested that we're only able to know things through our senses, through empirical knowledge. In other words, if you can't taste it, touch it, smell it, or hear it, you can't really know it. And even then, you only know the appearance of things. That's Kant in a very diluted nutshell. But that makes sense, right? We know things through our senses. If you spend any time at our preschool, you'll quickly learn that kids learn and know by manipulating things. They play, they touch, they feel, they act out, they see it, they smell it. A couple of weeks ago, they spent 20 minutes gathered around this rectangular glass box because a snake lived in that box. And the snake was shedding its skin. And one of the kids noticed, it's like, what's this snake doing? Why does it keep rubbing itself against this rock? And oh my gosh, its skin's falling off. So all the other kids come around. And they watched this process happen. They learned about the snake by watching the snake. They also just finished up their first project. We do a lot of project learning in the preschool that's geared by the kids' own excitement. When they want to learn about something, when they show excitement about something, they do a project on that. And their first project, as you saw, was on fire trucks. And some firemen and fire trucks came to the church, and the kids came outside, and they learned about fire trucks. The firemen explained the fire trucks. They showed them their coats and hats, and the kids got to try them on. The kids experienced the fire truck. They touched it. They touched and felt the hoses. They touched the axe. They sat in the seats and held on to the steering wheel. They walked around with a little graph and counted how many wheels, how many ladders, how many hoses, how many lights on the top. They interviewed the firemen and asked them questions about the fire trucks. They were interested in fire trucks, and they learned from them because the firemen came and revealed fire trucks so they could experience it. And they went back to their class, and they built their own fire truck, as you saw in the video, out of a refrigerator box. They had the coat and the hat and the boots there where they could play firemen. They built a fire station out of blocks. They had pictures of fire trucks on the walls. They were enveloped in fire trucks. That's how they learned. We learn through our senses. You might have already learned that we will just have one service on Sunday, December 25th, Christmas morning at 1030. Perhaps you've seen it in the chimes, or maybe you've heard it announced as you have just now. Maybe you wrote it down to help you remember because the act of writing and manipulating the information helps you understand and eternalize it. Now you know there's only one service at 1030. If you didn't read it or hear it, you wouldn't know, would you? You might show up on Christmas morning at 9 o'clock and be very lonely for a while on Christmas, and that's sad. If Kant is right, and philosophy and theology have been influenced ever since his writing of the Critique of Pure Reason, and you can only learn through your senses of what you can see and touch, what does that mean about our knowledge of God? Because we can't touch God, we can't hear God, we can't see. I haven't had God shout down to the loudspeaker of a cloud lately. How do we know God if we can't sense? Karl Barth, the mid-20th century theologian, argued that we can't know God just by looking at ourselves or the world around us. In fancy theological terms, there is no analogy of being. 
God is an entirely different being, so we can't look at ourselves and have that reflected on God. We can't just exponentially multiply aspects of ourselves and create a picture of God. That's been the charge of several philosophers through the years, that they say humans just create a God by making infinite what is finite in humans, and enhancing any perceived goodness in humans and making God just the infinite example of that good attribute. One of these guys was named Ludwig Feuerbach. He greatly influenced Karl Marx and Adolf Hitler, actually. But Bart says, no, 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 that's all wrong. We don't need to do that. We can't come to God just by looking at ourselves or creation. You know, you may not realize it, but a lot of our basic theological assumptions come from Greek philosophy, which did just that. It started with the human or the natural experience and worked up to God. Because they didn't have a way to experience God, so they thought, you know, what must God be like? If there's a God, what must that God be like? And they would think things like, well, it had to be perfect and not be able to suffer, not be able to change. And so they thought all these things just by looking at the world and thinking what God must be like. They had no experience of God, but they still defined God. That's called a priori thinking. It's a fancy Latin term, literally meaning from the earlier. It's knowledge independent of experience. For example, if the preschool children were trying to design a fire truck without ever experiencing a fire truck, what, they, what might they design? They might make it tie-dye color with three wheels and a goat on top instead of a ladder. Because they have no experience with fire trucks, they'd have to just kind of make up what might a fire truck be like if one such thing existed. But they actually experienced the fire truck, didn't they? And so when they built their fire truck, they built it based on that experience. If you watch this thing, Pam said, well, why, why did you paint this fire truck red? And the kid said, well, because fire trucks are red. That makes sense, right? What they're actually doing, though, is philosophical, epistemological thinking of a posteriori thinking, which is thinking based and dependent upon experience. She asked, well, why did you make the lights red, blue, red, blue, red, blue in that pattern? Well, because that's the way the lights are on the fire truck. Well, why did you make the wheels gray and black? Because the wheels on the fire truck were gray and black. They experienced the fire truck. And they use that experience to base their knowledge off of. That's called a posteriori thinking. Now, Bart said that's how we have to come to God. We don't just define God how we think God should be. And that's where revelation comes. And we can't know God unless God reveals God's self to us. For example, the congregation would never have known why my dad wasn't at that pageant if I hadn't revealed it to him. They might have thought, well, maybe he was sick. It is cold and flu season. Maybe they thought he was at home preparing the Christmas dinner. He did that. He cooked. Maybe he thought, you know, family was coming and he had to wait for them and get their bags in. They could have thought all sorts of things. They would have thought, you know, what makes sense based on the situation? Let's make something up. But since I revealed that he was at home watching the Atlanta Falcons play football, then they knew. They wouldn't have known except for that revelation. We wouldn't know about God except for God's revelation to us. The children wouldn't have known about the fire truck if the fire truck hadn't come to them. We wouldn't know about God if God hadn't come to us. Imagine shepherds tending their sheep and flocks by night. They'd have no idea that a baby was being born in a stable that night. I mean, how often do you think, you know what? I bet there's a baby being born in a stable. Let's all go look around at all the stables because there's nothing else to do and see if what happens to be born and buy some cows. And now I know Bethlehem's not a real happening place back then, but they probably had better things to do. They would have never known if the angels hadn't have said something. They would have never known that this child was Emmanuel, God with us. They would have never known that the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, had been born. The angels hadn't appeared and revealed it to them. We know God through experience because God has made God's self known in Jesus Christ. God came to earth so that we might experience God, learn directly from God. As Jesus spoke, as Jesus acted, as Jesus healed, we can experience Jesus. We know God because of Jesus Christ, and we know Jesus because of the Bible. That's the key phrase right there. I make our confirmation students always memorize it. We know God because of Jesus, and we know Jesus because of the Bible. Jesus is the primary revelation of God. 
We're going to talk in two weeks about the word incarnation. That Jesus is God made flesh. So anything that's true about Jesus is true about God, right? You know, if we have to learn through our senses, and God is a whole other being that we can't sense, well, if God becomes a human, can we sense that person? Can we hear that person? Can we see that person? Can we touch his hands and his side? Can he touch us and heal us? And so we know Jesus, we know God because of Jesus, and we know Jesus because of the Bible, because those people who experience Jesus, from the prophets experiencing the word of God through the apostles, they wrote down their experience. And so we learn through that. The early Greek philosophers said things like God couldn't suffer. Because their idea of a perfect being suffering, they thought suffering was inherently bad. And so God couldn't have something bad happen to God, right? This makes sense. And so a long time there was this idea that God couldn't suffer. It's called patripassianism. Uh, passion, suffering, patri, father. The father couldn't suffer. But Bart said, well, if Jesus is God and Jesus suffered on the cross then God must be able to suffer. If it's true about Jesus, it must be true about God. If Jesus can do something, then God can do something because we believe Jesus is God made flesh, right? We believe Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the Word of God incarnate. So what, far be for us to say what God can't do if God has come and done it, right? It took us until the mid-20th century to figure this out. I'm not sure why. But luckily we have Bart. God reveals God's self in Jesus Christ. If we had not, if we didn't have this revelation, we couldn't have faith. Because faith is trusting and knowing God through a relationship. And if God didn't reveal God's self to us, how can we have a relationship? How can you have a relationship with someone you can't know? Relation, revelation is the foundation of faith. And we couldn't experience grace if there was no revelation because we wouldn't even know forgiveness and acceptance was being offered. Revelation is the ground of our entire relationship with Christ because that's how we know who to have a relationship with. That's how we know how to have a relationship. If not for revelation, we wouldn't know the good news for all people. We wouldn't know that a Savior has been born in the city of David. We wouldn't know that God wants a relationship with us. We wouldn't know that God is love. We wouldn't know that God is with us and God is for us. If not for revelation, we wouldn't know, we wouldn't experience, and we wouldn't share. You know, the point of the fire truck show, the kids putting on this thing, was for them to share their knowledge. At first, as Pam said in the video, the firemen were the experts. And the show, the kids are the experts. Because they wanted to share what they learned and they experienced. Once they had the firemen come and show them and teach them. Fire trucks kind of became the thing in the classroom. The entire classroom was changed around to fit this fire truck learning. They built fire stations. They built the fire truck. They put on the costume. They played fire. And they were excited about fire trucks. And they wanted to share that knowledge with their parents. In Bloom's taxonomy, it's called metacognition, that they now own, they internalize that knowledge, it becomes parts of them. And when you have that knowledge, you're excited about what do you want to do, but share it, right? And so they put on this show, and they showed what they did, why it was important, what they learned. They shared it. The shepherds got good news from the angels, that for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. They received this good news, and it changed their lives. It changed the order of what they were going to do. They left. Well, they didn't leave their flocks. We didn't say they took them with them. They carried them on their shoulder, as my little manger scene says in my house. And they went to Bethlehem, and they saw the child. They might have even held the Savior of the world in their arms. They probably asked Mary, how did this happen? When did you get the news? It changed everything for them. They were excited about this baby born in a manger. And scripture says they went and they shared the good news with everyone. It says, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And everyone who heard it was amazed. They got the good news and they wanted to go and share it. Because it changed their lives. We were at United Presbyterian Church. We receive the good news too. We receive it from the scripture. 
from the prophets through the disciples and apostles. We experience God from this table. We experience God in our lives. We hear the good news every Sunday. Does this knowledge and experience change our lives? Does it change the way we live? Does it change the order of our days? Is it the most important thing that we get excited about? If so, how do we carry out the mission of the church to share the love and grace of God? How do we internalize and own that knowledge? What's our fire truck show? The shepherds had their fire truck show, right? They went and told everyone the good news and they were amazed. They got the revelation, they learned about it themselves, and they shared. We get the revelation. We've learned about it in church and in Bible study and Wednesday nights and reading scripture. We experience God at the table. So what's our fire truck show? What do we do to share it? Do we have as much excitement as these kids? I mean, they're, they're all doing a cheer and shouting. How often do we do a cheer and shout? I mean, they were so excited about fire trucks. They wanted to share that information. Do we get as excited about the good news that Christ has come? That God is incarnate in the world today to save us from our sins, to let us know God so we can have a relationship with the God of the universe. This happens because a baby is born in a manger. Does it change the order of our lives? Is that become the most important thing? What's our fire truck show? The second night of the pageant, my mom reminded me, Stephen, you have a small part with no speaking lines. I said, all right, I'll do good. I had my little robe on, my little slippers. I held my sticks. I followed Mary in. I put them on the table. And Mary said, thank you, children, for helping me. Now I think I hear your dad's calling. I kept my mouth shut. I walked back to my seat where my mom and dad were, and I got there, and I said, You see, Mom, I didn't say anything this time. <laughs> I hope that's not us this Christmas. I hope that's never us. For unto us a child is born, a child is given, who is the Messiah, the Lord. What a revelation, what news, what knowledge, what an amazing thing to experience. Let's go tell it on the mountain, shout it from the rooftop, share it any way we can. Say Merry Christmas, because the reality is, it's not Walmart's job to say Merry Christmas. It's not the radio station's job to say Merry Christmas. It's not the government's or anybody else's. It's our job to say Merry Christmas. We say it because it changes our lives. We say it because it's the joy we have we want to share with others. It isn't making someone else have to celebrate Christmas. It's saying, we want you to have the merriment we feel. We want to share the good news that has been revealed to us. Because we've experienced the power of Christmas, we want you to have a merry one too. We speak from ourselves and our experience. We don't have to have somebody else, some organization say it for us to make it matter. It doesn't matter. Who cares about that? We say it. We say Merry Christmas. If someone says Happy Hanukkah to me, awesome. You're saying you want me to experience the thing that God experienced did for your people that's part of our tradition too making candles last a long time the miracle of god's being present great you wish me a happy that good because that means something to you and it ought to mean something to me too we say merry christmas not to make someone else feel something but because it's important to us it's like the kids in the fire truck we want to share what we have been experiencing what we have known what has been revealed to us that's our job. That's our fire truck show. Hopefully our fire truck show is saying Merry Christmas and a lot more than that. Hopefully our fire truck show is the life and worship of this congregation so that people may know who God is. Hopefully our fire truck show is the way we live every single day that tells people, you know what? Jesus Christ came to earth and is my Lord and Savior. Save me from my sin and let me know who God is. That's what's important to me. That's what I change my day around. That's what I want to reenact and play and make every single day. That's my fire truck show. That's the purpose of our church, right? To share the love and grace of God through worship, mission, education, and fellowship. That's why we have that mission, because we've been revealed such great news we want to share. 
such great news. So come January 1st, when we come back after Christmas and we wrap presents and all, all that stuff, I hope we don't come back and say to each other, you see, I didn't say anything this time. Because if we should say something, it's Merry Christmas. It's Christ was born for me and Christ was born for you so that we can know God, have a relationship with God, and be with God forever because God is ever with you. Emmanuel, let us pray together.